G'day guys and welcome to another live stream Q&A answering all of your questions about moving to Australia. My name's Ross and I moved with my family to Australia during a global pandemic and for the last two and a half years I've been sharing our life with you in Australia hoping to help and inspire you to also make the move yourself. Now I think I've got all of the settings sorted from last time uh the camera should be fine and this time this mic should be working so the audio should be a bit better than last time i apologize to everyone who watched it and listened to that crap but grab yourself a drink and let's get started right i'm going to start as ever for those of you that don't know, we have an Instagram, we even have a TikTok as well. I posted a story earlier this week sharing with you that we were going live today and I've got a few questions um, that I'm going to start with answering before I answer anyone else's who's got some questions for me. So get them up. They are here and ready. So this one's from Darren. Um, have property prices gone up since you bought your house? <sighs> Is Brisbane housing going up? Yeah. I mean, since the pandemic, we moved during the pandemic. Australian house prices have gone up pretty much all over the country. Some places have risen more than others. Um, a couple of things that have affected Brisbane. So in particular, um, people have moved up from Sydney, Melbourne. That's driven house prices up. Um because a lot of Australians uh, or people that are resident to Australia have also moved here, that's driven the prices up as well. And then the last thing that's probably helped to drive the prices up the most, and don't forget Brisbane, Southeast Queensland, this is the fastest growing area in the whole of Australia. The thing that's mainly driven the prices up for that is the Olympics and all of the infrastructure and extra upgrades that are going to go in. Yeah, we're not going to build like major stadiums but just the the infrastructure and the transport and everything that's going to be needed to support that that m amount of investment that's gone into this area has also driven house prices up as well so unfortunately if you're looking to move to Brisbane, it's probably not going to be as cheap as if you had started looking at this area two or three, maybe even four years ago when that's when we first started looking. But I still think that living in Brisbane is still a lot more affordable than perhaps if you wanted to live in Sydney or Melbourne. Um, probably a, if you're comparing it to places like Adelaide or Perth, it might seem a little bit pricey now. But if you're looking at Sydney or Melbourne, Brisbane is probably still somewhere that you can get a bit more value and a bit more bang for your buck if you're looking at housing. Um, one of the series, hey Daniel, just seeing you there. Um, one of the things that I used to do on this channel is I used to look at house prices um, across different cities in Australia and kind of compare them to the average price of a house in the UK. I've not done some of those recently, and if that's something that you'd like me to do, not even necessarily comparing it to the average house price of the UK, but just what can you get for different amounts of money in those different cities, uh, let me know in the comments, uh, and I'll also I'll look at doing some of those kind of videos again. But great question, Dan, and I know, Dan, you've got a few questions here. Daniel, could you let me know? Is the audio okay? Is this mic picking everything up? Because I think I've got the settings, but, you know, I'm a bit of a techni technical noob sometimes. Um, Darren's also asked from a Brisbane perspective, where do you recommend living north of the city? Um, being a north sider, I have to recommend all of it, really. Um, but it really does depend on your budget. So, so for something that I'd kind of call as like a normal budget, if you're going to live in any of the directly northern suburbs, so places like Hamilton, Ascot, Kedron, some of those places are going to seem kind of scarily expensive for what you get. But don't forget how close you are to the city. And I'm, when I'm saying scarily expensive, I'm, I'm talking in excess of a million dollars and it's not a lot of land space. Cheers, Daniel, for that. Let me know the mic's good. But I would say 
if you're going to look for something that's probably reasonably affordable, you're going to look for anything sort of around or, or definitely north of the North Pine River. And so that's looking at everything that essentially moves out of Britain, Brisbane City Council and then goes into Moreton Bay Council, which is where we are. The one, the best piece of advice that I could give you, and it's really difficult for me to name specific suburbs. I mean, where does everyone seem to go? North Lakes, anywhere around North Lakes isn't necessarily going to be too bad because that's where you've got all of the big shopping and there's a really large expat community in North Lakes as well. It's, it's a nice area. Um, but I would say, look at what you want from your lifestyle. If you want something that's more beachy, then obviously on the peninsula, the beaches aren't necessarily the greatest, but there's beaches there. You can see the sea every morning if you want to. Um, anywhere that's got easy access to the Bruce, anywhere that's close to a train line and can get you into the city if that's what you need to do for work. So I would probably look at those main parameters. And then with the view that if you're thinking about schooling, a lot of people do actually go across different suburbs if they want to in particular for independent schooling but just look at what the schools are in your area if you're going to go for a nicer area that you you like the look of chances are the schools are going to be okay so it's, it's tricky but the short answer is probably anywhere around north lakes you're not going to be too far wrong um same darren's been piling on these questions uh what did you do to make friends more easily when you moved that's probably one of the bigger questions that we get asked about people when they move here. How can you make friends? And the easy answer to that is you just need to get out and put yourself out. If you're going to be staying indoors or doing things as a family unit on your own, obviously it's going to be more tricky to, to find friends. If you have a family, though, you're going to make friends through your kids. It seems to be an easy talking point on that line if you can just do it through your kids you're going to find friends that way join clubs um go to the pub i mean if you are an introverted person that's not going to put yourself out there and give those kind of opportunities yes it's going to be a little bit more difficult to find friends but just find anything that would be true to you as well as trying something new like think to yourself this is a big change moving to the other side of the world what is it that i would now like to do that's a bit different and you will always find friends there. Australians are incredibly chatty, even for people that are like expats like yourself from whatever country they are. But that's a, a common talking point that you can start a conversation with. If you don't want me to keep going through my questions on Instagram, just pop a question down in the chat and I'll uh, answer that one straight away as well. Um, is the weather still nice in winter? Shorts and t-shirts. I mean, today is a little bit cloudy and I was wearing a, a jumper and, and long pants. You know, I don't necessarily call them trousers all the time. I, I, it's been nearly three years for us and I would say that I am well acclimatized to living here. Anytime the temperature starts with a one, you know, or lower at night in particular, it can get down to single figures. To what extent would you say, hey, Ross, are we going to be really going around at night? Probably not, but Australian houses aren't the best for insulation, shall we say. They don't, they are designed to help the hot go out, particularly in summer when that helps. But during the winter, I mean, all of our windows are single pane. You, you don't get much double glazing around here. So it gets real cold at night. So you're going to have to find a way to, to heat your house. I've even been asking Samantha, should we invest in like a log burner or something like that? God knows where it will go in the house, um, especially with the flu and everything. But it, it gets cold and you forget when you're spending most of the year wearing shorts and T-shirt that, yeah, I have got some long pants. I have got some jogging bottoms. I have got some things that I probably will need to use for about three months of the year. So those little vacuum pack things that you can get for your wardrobe just to put your winter clothes in. It's nice. It's nice to have a little bit of a change to wear something different. Um, but I, I don't, um, I don't miss the cold at all. Uh, La Mima, thanks for your content. Uh, come to New Zealand. It's way better than Aussie. Oh, we've been there before. Um, that's actually where I proposed to Sam. Uh, we went on a trip to New Zealand uh, for a friend's wedding. Uh, I didn't steal their thunder by doing it at the wedding, of course. I'm not that low. Um, but 
yeah, no, we loved it. We love Queenstown. We love the South Island. Definitely we'll go back though. We'll definitely go back because we want to visit the North Island and the geography teacher in me wants to kind of see some some volcanic stuff. So that would be cool. Uh, Neil, lived in Cairns the last 25 years. Winters only last three days. If Yeah, if you want a place that you're pretty much not going to be guaranteed winters then definitely the the further north you go um the easier that's going to be to escape the cold and that works the other way around if you're someone that wants to move to australia for that lifestyle i often hear people saying about you know i, I love the seasons uh, i i don't i don't want to lose that from where i live obviously the season for me living in the uk and as with much of the northern hemisphere is like i hate those winters um, especially when we didn't really get snow. That seems to be the joy about having a nice winter. If you still like seasons, the further south you go, um, Melbourne, Adelaide, Sydney, those states will definitely give you more seasonality. If that's something that you like. For me, no, nah, prefer, much prefer the warm. Um, paid a banda. I'm thinking about relocating from Manchester. I've got a job offer. I have been looking into applying for a 186 visa. If I apply through sponsorship, will it make things quicker than if I apply on my own? I mean, that would be something that you'd have to look uh, on the immigration website and, and check just for the visas that you're looking for what the, the lead times are, because I know that they're, they're constantly changing. I would go as far as to say, though, I think the sponsorship visas, generally speaking, they take less time. Um, but I would always be thinking to myself, rather than what is the process that's going to get me to Australia the quickest, if, if, you, if you've got a route to Australia that's going to get you there, don't worry about which one is going to be the quickest. You should worry more about which one is going to afford me permanent residency faster. So if you're on a sponsorship visa, that's probably going to be some form of temporary visa. You're not going to get all of the same benefits as if you are a permanent resident. So if that has a longer lead time to you eventually getting to permanent residency, I would just stick to the route that's going to get you permanent residency quicker because that then you'll find it easier to buy a house. If you've got children, it will be cheaper on education. You can get childcare subsidy. So don't look at it as which one's going to get me into the country the quickest. So you, you know, you've, you're fortunate that some people, for, for some people, it's more of a case of which one is going to get me in the, the country, period. So if you have the opportunity to go for permanent residency or sponsorship, go for whichever route is going to give you the permanent residency faster. And I hope that makes sense. Daniel Phillip, I'm following you since your beginning. Cheers, bud. God, that's a few videos that you've unfortunately had to watch, but thanks for your support. Um, thanks for your content. What do you think? How long does it take to get the skills assessment back? And is it true to wait until 30 months to get a visa? Again, that really depends on what your skills assessment body is um, and also what visa you're applying for. I know that some are faster than others. There's there's different skills assessment bodies for if you're um, a tradie, if you're like a nurse, or if you're a teacher like me. My, my one was um, eight saw was uh, how I had to get my um, skills assessment through. And I remember that when I did it, the from when I think I submitted my skills assessment in something like the July, I finished all of the paperwork for it. And I must have got it back in about the September because pretty much as soon as it was done, our visa agent put our expression of interest in. So it, it'll be a few months, I would probably imagine. It, it's, it's Australia. Things don't happen quickly. Um, but no, 30 months, some of them are. But I know that in the last six months, for example, a lot of those lead times for visas have shot straight down. So I would be surprised if it's 30 months to get a visa. But I know that there are some that are, are clocking up, taking that long. So if you're applying for that one, that, that could be you. Uh, Carrie Welsh, why did you choose Queensland, Queensland over other states? I'm an Aussie and I've lived in four different states. We've lived in Victoria, Queensland, Taz, and now Western Australia and Perth. I think Perth has better. Yeah, I mean, for the majority of probably British people that are used to that Mediterranean drier heat, then definitely Perth is going to be is going to be better for you. I'm not going to lie. It gets really hot and humid for probably at least a couple of months in Queensland, um, even for us, Brisbane, Southeast Queensland, God, God forbid what it's like further up. I remember when we came to Australia, me and Sam, after that New Zealand trip, 
uh, and it was Christmas time and we went to visit Cairns uh, and, the, and the reef. And I don't remember it being super, super humid, but within ourselves, we had that kind of expectation that it was going to be hot. Um, why did we choose Queensland over any other state? I mean, to be honest, we couldn't afford Sydney. We couldn't afford Melbourne. And I just went for the next largest geographical area, knowing that I'm probably more likely to get a job there. We definitely did look at Perth. Um, I know for lots of Brits, Perth is the, the ideal place to live in. But for me, I just didn't like the idea of if we ever wanted to go anywhere not anywhere else in Australia is in like, well, you can go anywhere else in Australia, but any, any of the places that potentially we would want to go sooner rather than later, like going down to Sydney, I I felt that the East coast would be better for us rather than Perth. Would I still want to visit Perth? Do I still want to visit lots of WA? Yes. But I mean, I've got two young kids. The youngest is nine or 10 months old now. To, coming up to 10 months old. I do know the age of my child. Um, I'm not that bad of a father, I like to think. I just didn't want to kind of feel like I was stuck there in the first instance, particularly with how our family dynamic was going to go and how difficult it can be sometimes traveling with young kids. Um, but that, that's the, it couldn't afford Sydney, couldn't afford Melbourne. But if you have that mentality that it's going to be hot, it's going to be humid, you just, you, it, it takes a year to get used to it. That first summer is a bit of a killer, but after that, you, you're fine. Uh, Paul, now La Mima is coming. La Nina, I'm assuming he's saying. Uh, there's going to be more days over 40 and more days in the mid 30s here in Victoria, back to normal weather. Yeah, I mean, climate's changed. Um, we're going to get warmer. Biscuit and gardening. Morning, Ross. Hope you're well. Yeah, that's one thing I was thinking about. Is this too early for some people in the UK? Let me know in the comments if you want it to be a little bit later next time. Well, I don't know, let's push it to, to 6 p.m. Like, let's let's have a little bit of a laying. I know, I know it can be a little bit early sometimes, particularly if you're watching in the UK. Um, so when you first arrived, uh, was not having a credit score an issue when looking to buy a home? If so, are there any ways to overcome that? Also, your thoughts on Havits. Havertz. Don't know what Havertz is. Can you let me know what that is? And I'll, I'll see. Otherwise, I might have to give it a bit of a Google. Um, no, we didn't find having a credit score an issue. I mean, probably if you're going to think about it from a preferential rates perspective, obviously not having a credit score, you might not necessarily get the greatest rate, but you're going to get a rate. Um, and also it depends on, on how much deposit you have. So you know, we we are owned a home in the UK. We sold everything up there, so we had a, a quite a substantial deposit to be able to buy this home with. But as long as you've got you know a uh, a job with a permanent contract, you've got pay slips to support that. If you've got a partner that's also got a job with a permanent contract, that's really really going to help as well. Um, but the one good thing I guess that if you don't really have a credit score is that they they don't. They want to see your purchases over the first few months. So it can be a bit of a problem when you first move here and you know you're, you're bleeding money. But as long as you're sensible with your, your purchases and they can see that and that you've got proof of income and you've got a, a deposit from the UK from selling up there, it, it's not necessarily a problem. And the same thing goes for, for finance as well. If you want to you know, buy a, a newer car, that, that no, no issues. And I've not known anyone to have any issues um, as long as they've got permanent contracts um, and, and a little bit of money in the pocket from selling up everything in the UK. So hopefully that'll help. Uh, T-Bones Fishies. Uh, g'day, mate, from the Gold Coast. Been watching you guys for a while on YouTube and enjoy your clips. Cheers, bud. Thanks for the support. Um, Carrie Welsh, we live in Griffin for nearly 10 years, got married near Cairns. They didn't like the humidity so much. Uh, Perth's very reasonable for housing and fantastic beaches. Absolutely. And, and actually in response to someone else that asked about areas, we we know some people that live in Griffin. It's a nice area. Um, we even thought about renting there. That was one of the places that we looked at um, first off. The reason why we didn't rent in Griffin was just prices really we, we found a cheaper price that we lived in brendale would i recommend living in brendale probably not permanently but if you're looking at where's a suburb that i could live and there's rental properties available there, there's normally lots of kind of townhouse developments in brendale 
close to the Bruce, close to Strathpine for shopping, easy access to North Lakes. There's a train line at Strathpine as well. Uh, yeah, I would I would definitely recommend Brendale as a place to rent um, just to get you started. So that's another area. Uh, Angelo, hope you're well. Yeah, no, all good, mate. Cheers. Uh, Neil, Perth is a beautiful but very isolated. Yeah, I'd agree. I wouldn't say so isolated. We're, we're a globalized world. It's definitely seemed isolated during COVID when they kept shutting the borders. But yeah, it, it, you're right, but Neil. It's not as easy as you can you can get in the car and just go somewhere. For example, you know, we're, we're just going to go up to Harvey Bay for a couple of days tomorrow. For us, we can just get in a car and we can drive places. We can get, a, get in a car and we can drive to Sydney. Drive a little bit further, you can actually get to Melbourne. It's not too prohibitive of, as perhaps Perth. Uh, Rianne, fan from the Netherlands here. Oh, nice to see you. Uh, I want to say thanks for the content. We've been in the skills visa process for well over three years. Wow, what's taking so long? My husband is a physio and the skills assessment is killer to get done. Wow, ouch. I have not really had many conversations with physios actually so i'd really be interested to once you get your skills assessment sorted i'd really be interested to know more about what it's like and, and also what are your motivations for wanting to to move to the nether move from the netherlands uh for those of you that don't know we have a, a podcast uh we're always looking for new people that want to share their journey share their experience for everyone else um to, to learn from it and what it's like if that's you. If you want to come be on the podcast, let me know, pop us a DM, send us a message on Instagram. Um, and yeah, we can get that sorted out. Um, what's the child support all about that you've, uh, experienced with your second? So I think Rihanna, you talking about childcare subsidy. So childcare subsidy is, uh, a payment that you receive in Australia to that goes towards the payment of childcare. You don't actually receive the payment. You just apply for it and it goes straight to your childcare provider. Um, this is means tested in the sense that it depends on how many children you, you need childcare for and also your total earnings as a household. So the more you earn, the less you get, the less you earn, the more you get. Uh, and also from the perspective of how many hours are you both working? So if only one of you is working, then you won't really get um, like all of the the week's worth of childcare for your kid because they'll kind of go well hey you, you're available why aren't you looking after your kid so if both of you are working um, you will get childcare subsidy that will cover part of the cost for childcare um, for as many kids as you've got particularly if you're full-time um, when we first started um our household income wasn't a lot because it's done on the the tax year. So we obviously moved kind of halfway through. So we got loads of childcare subsidy. And I think for Aurora, it was costing about $15 a day just to, just to put her in because our earnings for that year were so low. Now for two kids where we are, it's probably for, for five days, them all in, it's probably just under 300 bucks is what we're paying for both of them. But the irony is that when you're for your second child, you get even more childcare subsidy for that kid. So if Aurora was just in on her own, it would cost about, let's say, low 200s maybe 230 and then to put sierra in it costs like an extra 60 bucks it's, it's crazy i was expecting childcare bills when both of them were in to be like oh my god i can't afford this but we were already paying about 200 and something dollars a, a week for for aurora and then the next one went in and it was still 200 and something dollars obviously the higher end of the 200 compared to the lower end but i was like hey this is this is actually affordable this is manageable so it's it's there's a it's a bit weird with how it kind of works out, but fundamentally it makes childcare, particularly for new migrants, for migrants that don't have a, a network of help for looking after your kid, it makes it a really, really affordable option. And we I just kind of think of it in the sense of, hey, okay, so it's costing me 60 bucks to put my kids in there. So the first 60 bucks that I earn for that day for my job, that's how much I have to spend be able to go for a start because i've got to put my kids into childcare um paid a banda is it early though <laughs> it's bloody 7 a.m over here but it's all worth it cheers we watch your videos all the time i, I mean I, the reason why i did put it at four o'clock is because i know that this is about the usual time unless i'm 
still editing right now or it's still uploading. This is about the usual time that I usually release videos. But if enough people kind of think, hey, let's go for a little bit later. Hey, maybe I'll, I'll go somewhere in the middle. I'll go five o'clock next time. Um, Biscuit and Gardening, Kai Havertz, new Arsenal player. Yeah. Uh, Declan Rice, is he a new Arsenal player? Uh, I'm a bit disappointed if we spent over £100 million on him. It's, that's definitely the England tax, isn't it? If you want someone that's from England. I'd probably be more happy with Havertz for the price that he we spent on him rather than Declan Rice. That's that's for sure. Uh, but hey, if we win, who cares? Angelo, uh, I've received a job offer with sponsorship. The employer is doing subclass 400 to get me there quicker than doing a 482 when I arrive. Does employer sponsor visas get processed quicker? Um, yeah. Generally speaking, sponsorship ones do get processed quicker because they they know they want that person to be working there as quickly as possible. But like I said before, if you need to think about it's particularly if your move to Australia is a permanent one, like this is it, I want to move here for, for good. Rather than thinking about which process is going to get me into Australia quicker, you need to be thinking about which one is going to give me a route to permanent residency faster. And I know that one of the actual changes to a lot of temporary skill shortage visas uh, came in into effect yesterday is that they are all, all I think, offering a... Um, a pathway, a route to permanent residency. So I'm sure you'll be able to get it, but definitely look at the immigration website if you're doing it yourself or, or perhaps a, a visa agent will be able to give you better advice on this, which one is overall going to give you your best route to permanent residency because that's where you get pretty much all of the same perks as being a, a citizen. You don't get everything if you're on a skill shortage or a sponsored visa, a temporary visa. Um, this is KP looking at come over in a couple of years as a special needs teacher. I know this is a high need uh, for visas, but there doesn't seem to be many jobs around in that area. Is this the case? Yeah. And if you're in the UK, Mrs. KP, they they don't really kind of call them special needs teacher. It It's not from what I've seen, particularly in Queensland, it, it's not like its own individual thing. Um, I would be looking, particularly when you're going to look for jobs, um, I would be just be looking for whatever your main subject is, or if you're a secondary teacher, obviously, or, or whatever your, your year groups are, if you're a primary school teacher. And I would be kind of aligning my resume, they call it a resume here, they don't call it a CV, to showcase your skill set in learning support, in, in additional needs for students. Um, I, I wouldn't be looking for those roles in particular. They do exist, but it's more like a case of you'll, you'll find them and you'll get into them um, once you, you've you kind of got your foot in the door of places. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a weird thing. They don't, yeah, they don't have Senkos or anything like that. They, they, they do. Even at our place, there's someone allocated to special needs, but they just don't. It's not set up in exactly the same way as the UK. Um, and for anyone that's thinking, oh, what, they don't have special needs provision for my kids if if they're going into schools and you're not a teacher. Of course they do. Yeah, you, your kids will be catered for. It's just it's not set up in exactly the same way as the UK. Um, hi, mates. Nigel, living here in Glasshouse Mountains. Lovely area. We uh, we love Mullaney. Um, been here for 21 years. Came to Oz without having been here before. Went back to the UK about five years ago for a holiday. It was nice to see relatives. But we're, we're literally having that discussion at the moment about going back to the UK uh, and we're looking at Christmas and flights they're about eleven and a half thousand dollars at the moment I think flights are just double the cost of what they used to be pre-covid and then obviously Christmas is is double the cost anyway so it seems like it's four times as much as it perhaps should have been to to, to go obviously not on, on holiday tax bloody pain of being a teacher but yeah, it, it doesn't really seem like a, a holiday for me if I was going back to the UK. I want to go. I want to see and visit all of the friends and family that we miss, but it's not holiday. Like, what what kind of holiday could I get for $11,500 if I was wanting to go in Australia or anywhere around here? It's, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, perhaps I'd, I'd feel better if they just came and visited us and we could really show them a holiday. But uh, Edith, Edith. We love reading your messages. Hello. Good to see you again. Um, 
we have we we have visited that has been one of the places that's where that if anything that was the first place that sam and i visited as as a proper couple because we were engaged but we will get up there soon we're ironically actually edith we're actually looking <laughs> it's if we don't spend eleven and a half thousand dollars on flights to the uk at christmas we might even just go on a cruise cruise from brisbane up to the Whit sundays cairns those are the locations that you normally see so hey we might be visiting Cairns sooner than visiting the UK, Edith. Um, Alvaro, mate, I have the same truck. <laughs> I just found your channel and seen the beach video. Greetings from Chile. They do GWM Utes in, uh, in Chile. Weird to know. I, I don't think they do them in the UK, which kind of, well, I know why they don't do them in the UK because they're, they're probably pretty drinky on the fuel and everything's CO2 monitored, but. I hope your one lasts as long as mine, mate. <laughs> Lamima, how long has it taken you to get to 12,500 subscribers? I'm enjoying your content as I make content in a similar niche. Oh, maybe we should do something together. My channel's all in Spanish. Um, yeah, my Spanish is a little bit limited. I only did a year when I was at uni, and I've probably forgotten most of that. Uh, how long? Well, we have been going since we emigrated here. So that was around about October um 2020 that's how long it's taken um just keep making videos and keep trying to help people and it will slowly slowly creep up the more people we can help the better uh ben hey ross hope you're well just jumped on cheers ben if you've got any questions pop them in the chat let us know if no one else has got any more questions at the moment i will go back uh to the ones from Instagram, still on Darren's questions because Darren's just smashed a load in. Um, is the internet in houses reasonably priced and how many megabytes per second do you get? Um, I, You hear so much, don't you, in, about Australia, the internet being crap. And when we were in quarantine in the center of the city, I remember in the hotel that we had, it was like 90 megabytes a second. And that was like crazy. So you can get really, really fast speeds. How much are they going to cost? Well, I, at the moment, I'm with Optus because I obviously want to watch the Premier League when it's on. So I pay uh, about $96 all in for all of the internet and the the sports and things like that. Um, and what do we get? It's like 25 down, 10 up. You can, though, if you just wanted just internet and you're not fussed about the sport kind of bit, I know I've seen packages because I know I'm not happy with how much I'm paying Optus, um, but they bloody got me with the sport. Um, I know that I could probably get a similar package, probably even a bit better, actually, sort of like a, a 50 down 25 up um, for maybe 70 bucks. So I don't think it's too expensive at all. And you know, where we were in the UK, I think, to be honest, the internet package that we have right now is probably the same. But, you know, <coughs> excuse me, um, we, we we had Sky and everything there. So the total amount that we spent on Sky for our TV and our internet was far, far higher than it, how much we spend here. And we probably get, from an internet perspective, a similar package. Just the problem is that Australian telly is crap. So... It's not like Sky, but we can still do the recording thing on our Optus, on our fetch box. A um, couple more questions here. Greetings from Germany. Ah, Daniel from Germany. Um, Rianne, cheers for answering. More on childcare and paid leave. Did Sam get any paid leave for Sierra? Yep, she did. She qualified for the full maternity leave. That was, I think we got 20 weeks at the minimum rate. It worked out at 750 bucks a week for 20 weeks. It's roughly what it is. Um, curious to know about how much time that was also for you. So for me, um, I mine was kind of all done through work. So technically, if you want to go for the state parental leave, that's something that you can share. So it's it's 20 weeks. And if you wanted to both have it, you and your partner could have 10 weeks, uh, 750 bucks a week if you wanted to. Um but because obviously as a teacher, I earn a bit more than the minimum wage. Um, I actually had it written into our enterprise bargaining agreement. So I um, 
I'm entitled at my place to get one week full pay, um, which was one week more than I ever got in the UK, which I was more than happy with. But then I also had it written into our EBA that in the uh, I would get 12. Yes, that's it. If you're the main carer, you get uh, up to 12 weeks full pay um, as long as you're the main carer. So what we did was um, once Sam was fit for work again after about eight weeks, um, we actually switched roles. So I became the main carer. I had probably about the last four weeks off at work um, before the summer break. um, And I was the main carer. Sam went back to work um, and I was on full pay. So it really does depend on what your EBA is at your wherever you work uh, and check the fine print. Um, But I would go as far as to say, I think in our experience, in total, we got a, a better deal um, with regards to parental leave after having our second kid in Australia than it felt like we would in in the UK. And also, the other thing as well is that Aurora would never went to childcare in the UK because it was so expensive. But for Sierra, straight away, it's, it's actually affordable for us. So, and yeah, we think it's better because of. We just saw how much Aurora developed as soon as she went into childcare here. She was definitely ready for that, you know, that element of learning, socialization, and hopefully Sierra will benefit even more from going into it earlier. We we can't provide the resources at home that they get on a daily basis at, at daycare. We also can't provide some of the germs that they bring home. And you might have noticed in my voice a little bit um, that a little bit of sickness has descended on the household, but hey. They gotta, they gotta build up the little immune systems, don't they? Uh, Andy Parker, hi Ross. On your last live Q and A, I asked about your thoughts on whether starting the process of forty two was too late. You basically said go for. Ah, oh, mate, awesome. We are skills assessment on Tuesday, six a.m. Andy, awesome. It, it. Do you know what? It is never too late because, I mean, you're saying at forty two, is it too late? I know. Well, everyone knows forty five is too late. You hit forty five mate, you don't have a choice anymore. You, you're not allowed in because you're too old. So when is too late? When they say you can't do it. So how shit would you feel? I don't really know if I should be swearing. How rubbish would you feel? Well, I haven't got a bleep button. How rubbish would you feel if you, oh, is it too late or should we do it? And then you, you know, you're you told by the Australian government at 45 now, mate, sorry, you can't come in. Don't let someone else decide what is too late for you. Only you can do it. So well done. Congratulations, Andy. Let us know how you get on, and I hope your skills assessment goes well. Uh, Re, I have been working for two years as a software software developer and for one year in an international bank for IT and business. Uh, is my experience counted as three years of work experience? Do you know what? I am not an expert in any of that at all, um, but I know some people who are. Uh, and if you want to know what your experience counts as and what your experience would qualify for, you definitely need to speak to True Blue Migration Services. Um, mention us. They'll give you a free visa assessment. They'll let you know exactly where does my experience, where do my qualifications, what does that entitle me to, to be able to move to Australia? And they'll be able to tell you all of your next steps. And it's it's completely free. There's no obligation. You can make your choice after that. Do I want to keep going with them? Do I want to do it myself? Um, I would never recommend doing it myself if I thought my situation was too complicated for me to be able to do it. Who, who would I what would I be if I was going to apply for a visa myself to do it over here? I would be, ironically, my niece, she's looking at coming over, um, probably not this year, but she's finishing school this year and she's going to want to come, she's going to want to come to Australia after that. So she'll, she'll be over whenever she's earned enough money to savings. That, is who I would be if I was looking to apply for a visa over here, like a working holiday visa, you fill it in online. You know, you've you've not got as much life experience, not as many forms to fill in. I even found it difficult trying to fill in all the place. It's called a form 80, form 80 or form 82. I can't remember. It's one of the last ones you do. And one of the questions that you have to do yourself, this is even the bit that the visa agent can't do for you. One of the questions is list every single country you have been to and the dates in the last 10 years. Thank God for Facebook, because I just went back through Facebook memories and all the places that we visited. But I don't know how to answer that. And that's probably one of the easier questions that you should be able to do. They get harder. 
who would I speak to re speak to a visa agent, speak to a Mara registered visa agent. Don't get um, scammed like we have heard from some other people. Um, and if you're worried about whether you think it's Mara registered, there's a Mara registered number. If they don't have a number, don't go with them. Even no matter how much, how many times they say Mara in their website, they have to have a number and you can even check up that number just to make sure it's all legit. Uh, Daniel, I want to move to Brisbane too. Can you recommend some good areas to live in? Um, I, I'm a north sider, so I'm always going to recommend the north side. Anywhere above the North Pine River was my previous answer. If you want the more detailed stuff, go back. Saying that though, there's definitely some lovely areas uh, on the south side. Um, I'm probably going to be more stretching towards the Bay Area because those are the places that I've personally been to. It's lovely out there. We we had a we went there for a weekend. Um, near Manly, I think it was. Not Manly, Sydney. I think there's a Manly in, um, in Brisbane. Beautiful, beautiful. No beaches, even though it's on the coast because we, we don't have beaches in Brisbane. Um, but yeah, it, it just depends. If you want to live in the north side, it's a better access to the Sunshine Coast. I would say it's a little bit more family friendly. That's probably what we're more into. Um, south side, easier to access to the Gold Coast. Uh, and for some people, you know, the theme parks, a lot more touristy. That's what they're into. So it's not to say that you can't get to it. Each other is easy. It's just which one do you have easier access to? Um, but yeah, main takeaways, probably you want to have it close to whatever your main motorway is just so you've got easier transport and probably find a, uh, a suburb that has got really easy close access to the train line so you can get straight into the city if that's what you need for work. Uh, Lamima, I would love to collab with you. I'd speak English, but with a Latina accent, I uh, would love to do something. Uh, drop us a, a message on Instagram. Um, find us on there. Drop us a message and we'll sort it out. Um, same thing if you want to be on the podcast as well. Uh, drop us a message on Instagram. Let us know. Uh, Alvaro, yeah, they come in different versions. Automatic manual. They're new in the country. Cheaper than traditional brands. Love my GWM. Pur, yeah, like power. Yeah, I heard that. Like a P series, they call them. Um, where did any of the Asian brands of vehicles start off? They had to start off somewhere. Um, I kind of think of it in the sense of I've got a seven year warranty. If anything happens with it up until then, nothing touch wood has happened yet. This is Ikea. Is it even wood? Um, nothing's happened to it yet. If it happens within the next seven years, they're going to sort it out for the next three or at least two years. They're going to come pick it up off the road for me as well. If it breaks, um, Ray greetings from Albania. My old hairdresser in the UK was Albanian. Love Albanians. Um, James, hey, hoping to move to Australia in the very near future. Your videos have really inspired me to try and make the move. I'm looking at Sydney. Would you know what kind of income would be required for a family of three? If you're going to go for Sydney, as much as possible. Um, to put it into perspective... The total family income, when you start to get, I say penalized, but you're kind of, I would say, qualified in the higher pay bracket because you start having to pay more Medicare contributions, um, things like that, is probably when you start total as a family getting in excess of $180,000. And for some people that are listening or might be watching this, you'd be thinking, holy crap, $180,000 total combined um, income for your family. That's that's a lot, like loads of money. Um, depending on which way you're going to measure the average, it's kind of any, it varies any way, anywhere from like 90,000 to late 60,000 as being like the average Australian wage. So I, I'd go as far as to say that if, if your total household income is above 120 then if you're going to go by the the lower end of the averages you should be able to do it will you be living in the middle of sydney probably not you're going to live on the outer suburbs like like we do in brisbane um but yeah ballpark figure 150,000 and you should be pretty sweet but the thing is that whatever it is that you're earning if that's your dream and that's what you want and you really really want to make it work you'll find a way um you'll definitely find a way. Uh, Debbie, what's that black thing on your screen? This is a microphone, darling. Oh, the speaker. Yeah. Your eyes are bad. It, yeah. Hopefully, because before I had this on here, um, 
and I don't think it was working. I think the settings were for the microphone on the laptop. Um, so hopefully I'll listen back to it later and hopefully I have set it up right. And at least you'll get kind of a similar audio I'm looking for that you would do on the podcast, which is probably the best that I can put out. Um, Debbie saying my sister moved to Canada. She said Australia is FD. I'm assuming that's, you know, the F word. Uh, the government is so corrupt and pathetic. Have you ever looked at the UK government in the last few years? I mean, I can't vote. I can't vote. So maybe I can talk about what what's my takes on the Australian government. Jesus. Two things you're not really supposed to talk about with friends, religion and politics. I, I live in Australia as someone who used to live in the UK and I compare everything to what my life was like before I moved here. And the only reason I wanted to move here was because I wanted my life to be better. I knew that I'm not going to make everything better. Australian politics, I think, maybe not much, maybe not on all of it, but I don't think it's worse than UK politics. And... Therefore, in my mind, it's not one of the major reasons why I wouldn't want to live here. And I hear so many people that are saying, oh, the government's corrupt, it's fascist or whatever fancy word that they've ever heard on a toilet paper, whatever it is. They, mate, if that's the reason why you're not going to want to live in the country, I can probably list a fair few countries in the world that you wouldn't want to live in because their government is an issue. I don't think Australia is one of them. But if that's you and you don't want to live here because of the government, you look at America, how many people are there like, oh, we hate the government. We have to have guns because we are going to protect ourselves against the government. Mate, the Australian government is not that. And if that's the reason why you don't want to live here, see you later, mate. There's plenty of planes. Hope the cost of flights isn't too much to prohibit you. That's my opinion. Um, also, Debbie, Debbie, you, you're full of joy today. There's no rent. There's no rentals. There, there are rentals. There are definitely rentals. Perhaps there's not rentals in exactly the place that you want to live. Sorry, mate. You shouldn't be so entitled that you have a right to live there. Um, I, I feel sorry for some people who are finding it difficult to find rentals. And yes, that is also the case. Um, lots of people are having to spend more of their disposable income or the income that they're earning on rentals. Um, but to say that there's no rentals, I think isn't fair. There are definitely rentals. You just have to might, you just might have to look at living, um, in an area that you perhaps hadn't considered before. But I do feel for those people that are finding renting an issue. Again, I'm comparing this to the UK because that's where I used to live and renting was a problem there. Um, renting was probably even more of a problem. Uh, I think that there are more, there's more legislation in Australia to protect people who rent in comparison to the UK and probably other countries as well. Um, I think sometimes, particularly for Australian people, they say, they say POMs whinge a load. I think sometimes Australians also whinge um, and because life here is so good, it doesn't take much to piss off an Australian so that they start to make it sound like it's the end of the world. Look at my latest podcast. The people that were there, they've, they've moved into their first rental. They actually, the issue that they found was getting their kid into childcare, but their first rental straight away. So to say that there's no rentals, it's, it's a hugely sweeping statement that does nothing to help the issue. Um, it's like saying all Australians put shrimps on the Barbie. It's wrong, mate. Um, Louise Tupper, my husband and I are moving later in the year. I'm 51 and he'll be 52, but we are coming on a 482 medics. It's never too late. Fantastic. Um, that kind of proves me wrong then in the sense, perhaps what I was thinking about when I'm thinking that 45 is too late is if you want to find a pathway to permanent residency and i know that 45 seems to be the cutoff because that's when the government starts to factor in things like medicare and costings and they, they basically want you to have paid into the system to be able to benefit from the everything that permanent residency does bring in but fantastic louise 
we need more medics. And thank you for coming over, even at the the later than my age stage of your life. I'm not going to say anything more than that. You know, who am I to judge what is old? That's for the government to decide. This this corrupt government, apparently. Uh, Daniel, hi Ross. Hope you're well. How's the housing crisis now with buying and renting? Calming down, uh, even from a Brisbane perspective, in the sense that um, fastest growing area in Australia is it's expensive. It's a hell of a lot more expensive than it was when I bought. Um, but hey, there are places to rent. There are places to buy. Unfortunately, you might not get your first choice, but you just have to think a little bit more about what your Australian dream looks like and, and what you're willing to, to take. You will you will still find houses to buy, houses to rent. I see them all, all the time when I'm driving around. And actually, one of the things that I have noticed is that they're not as quickly going anymore. And that's probably got something to do with um, interest rate hikes. Uh, Debbie, Louise, you'll have to live with Ross, lol, no rentals. Okay, Debbie, you're full of joy. Um, Hey Ross, girlfriend and I are moving in January, we want to move to Brisbane. Just wondering what the job market is like at the moment. Um, buoyant, I'd say. Um, I mean, I'm not looking for a job, so I've not got my toes directly in there. I've not heard of any people through here that have found it particularly difficult to find a job. Even from my perspective at the school that I work, we're always finding school-based apprenticeships for the kids that we teach. Uh, and I think last year we had over 90% of our kids had a school-based apprenticeship. So if that's a statistic that's going to kind of prove to you that it's relatively buoyant, depending on, on what kind of jobs you do. You know, definitely some bits are more in demand than others. Uh, Lorna, is the 300 bucks a week or a month for the childcare subsidy? It's a week. That's a week for uh, how much? Just less than that is how much we pay for. That's, so that's not the subsidy. And I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what percentage we get paid for it. Well, there you go. I, I know yeah, it's probably about half. We get half of it paid for us. Um. George, just joined so much. If I missed the talk about childcare, what age do they start school and what do you get in terms of funding for nursery? Again, George, it depends on your personal circumstances and how much you earn. It's all means tested. Uh, they can pretty much go into to nursery childcare uh, from like six weeks, depending on which ones. Some are slightly later, but they can go real early. Uh, what age do they start school? So Aurora starts school in um, in January. And she she will be four. And it's weird because unlike the UK where it starts in September and they their cutoff then is the end of August kind of thing, they start in the January, but the cutoff is, is the June, July. So end of June, essentially. So she's going to be one of the babies in the year because she's before that June kind of cutoff. Um, so she'll be about four and a half. So I think it's kind of like a tiny bit later, if I'm honest. It's not, there's not much in it. It's not, not like to worry about, but I do know that some people, for example, because of that, that different cutoff date, sometimes your kid might move over to Australia and then technically they have to go back a year because they, they don't fall in that this, it's not the same cutoff times. So that does happen very, very rarely. But um, <laughs> don't have a, don't have a go at Debbie. Debbie's just, you know, Debbie's just Debbie. Uh, Jomo, there are heaps of jobs out uh, in the regions where the costs of living are much better. Jobs galore for medical and allied professionals. <coughs> if you're If you're concerned about renting jobs and the competitiveness that there could be living in perhaps one of the the capital cities listen to the last podcast it's the literally the last video that we put out on the channel um the family that we we spoke to they they live down on the central coast it's like just over an hour outside of sydney so it's kind of like living in the sunshine coast in comparison to um brisbane if you want to look at something that's going to be cheaper, potentially depending on your job, like better for you from a work perspective, 
I would definitely be looking at one of the the outer more regional areas and that's definitely something that when I made the move myself I ne- it never even crossed my mind I, I literally listed it from uh, Sydney Melbourne and I was just going for the major cities I never looked at somewhere else and that's definitely something that I would consider now um, even just have a look it might not be for you but you never know until you look what can you get what's it like Hey, living in a more regional area, if you're worried about isolated, loads of people, hundreds, tens, tens of thousands of people move to Perth every year. What's the difference? Um, so thanks for that, Jomo. Um, George Rigby. I was just mentioning to there. <laughs> Jordan. Haha, is her real name Debbie or Karen? We'll never know. People like to hide behind keyboards. Um, Luke. Moving from London, the renting crisis can't be as bad. £2,000 a month for a one bed with no windows. So what's that? Four and a half. Well, let's just divide it by four. So it's £500 a week. A thousand, best part of $1,000 a month. 900, 900 bucks. Sorry, my maths was there. $900 a week for a one bed with no windows. Now I'm sure if you looked at renting in Sydney, you could probably find something just as good as that. Um, but yeah, it, it really does depend on where you're moving from and where you're moving to. If you're coming from just plucking a northern town out of here now, like Wigan, you're probably going to be getting a lot of house for spending. But if, like us, you're coming from the southern part of the UK, mate. Hey, London, that's crazy money. I don't know how people can afford that. And then how much it costs for a pint. Um, James. Do you know what? How do I do this? See you later, Debbie. Uh, James Arnold, thanks for asking my previous question. How do you find getting a mortgage in Australia? Um, We have a house in the UK, which we would sell and use the money as a deposit, but we wouldn't have any credit. You'll probably be fine, James. Um, If you've got PR, if you've got a permanent contract for your job, you only have to work there for a few months. And then it'd probably take you that long to, to try and find a house anyway and try and find a, a, a home loan. So, yeah, shouldn't have an issue as long as you've got a bit of a deposit. I think the standard over here is 20%. Like, you'll be good. Uh, Robert, is it hard expensive to be an entrepreneur in Australia? I guess it depends. Um, I, no, it doesn't kill your dreams in asking lots of taxes because – The amount of tradies that are technically sole traders, according to the ATO, no, I don't think it does kill your dreams for asking a lot for taxes. Yes, there are um, loads of people whinge about Australia's got more taxes than the UK or more taxes than other places. Well, for a start, um, GST, which is the same as VAT, so the, the sales kind of tax, is 10%. So that's less. Um, Australia's the only country, I've only lived in two countries, but tax time is coming up now. I've got to fill my tax return in uh, and I will be getting money back because you can claim um, offsets from your total earnings because of things. I can claim for suntan lotion because I've got to use that while I'm at work. Anything that I have to use for my work, I can claim off my total um, income. So the average tax return in in Australia is something like 2000 and something bucks. You never get a check every year in the UK for $2,000, a thousand pounds for here you go, here's some money back. So I would go as far as to say, no, I don't think it kills your dreams in asking lots of taxes. Um, Everywhere's going to ask for tax. Death and taxes, the only two things that are guaranteed in life. 
James, I've looked at houses on the domain app and they seem to be loads of auction properties, which, as you know, is different to the UK. Uh, do you know one of the things I have found since COVID um, and where the demand, particularly in Southeast Queensland, is higher? Yeah, there seems to be a lot more on auction or there seems to be a lot more now where they're like um, offers, like inquire. I think they're still keeping that open because they're more like – we don't know how much someone might be willing to pay. I know uh, a year and a bit ago when there was that big thing, everyone's trying to come up from Melbourne, everyone's trying to come up from Sydney, that you were literally getting people slapping $100,000 more than the asking price because that's what they could afford because they came from Melbourne and Sydney where things were so much more expensive. Um, I think some uh, rental, not rental, some real estate agents are doing that now in the sense that they're, they're – still not advertising a price but it, it, I, I have now seen more where there are offers in excess of you know they've gone back to that normal so hopefully for you James that shouldn't be something which continues to happen but I, I wouldn't use domain as well I'd look at realestate.com.au um, and that might give you a, a bit of a better steer for house prices and things when I start to make those videos again about what how type of houses you can get for how much money um, that's that's what I'll be using to, to kind of show you what what's about uh jomo mid north coast of new south wales great climate lots of employment opportunities regions newcastle the coffs harbour check good yeah mate some awesome areas uh around there uh we visited coffs harbour newcastle close to um the hunter valley you know just outside of sydney as well definitely it's not something that i ever thought about doing but if i was moving to australia now that's definitely something i would look into I've just heard the child come back. So we might get a visit from Aurora in a minute. Um, Paul, over here it's normal to live or drive 30 minutes to an hour from where you work. So you have a huge area to look for housing. Yep. Pretty standard coming from the UK as well. Um, apart if you're not my brother-in-law who insisted that he didn't want to travel any more than 25 minutes, which I thought was ridiculous. I, I, I was about an hour commute in the UK. So 30 minutes to an hour, depending on traffic. So yeah, you're right, Paul. Pretty standard. And here particularly in Brisbane, that can cover a massive area. There's lots to look for. Tammy Lee, uh, primary schools in Australia versus the UK. How do you find it? I don't yet because I haven't got one in there. I've literally got the forms that I've filled in for Aurora for next year, and I'm a bit late on doing that as well, but I'm lazy. Uh, my son is five and just about to start year one. Does the schooling start the same year as the UK? No, it doesn't tell me it starts in January. So depending on when he's born, he might have to redo a year, but not always. Uh, and is it more advanced or tech from a technology perspective? I mean, I didn't really have much experience of primary schooling in the UK because I didn't have any kids in it and I wasn't a primary school teacher, but I would go as far as to say, I think that on average, that it seems to be more technologically forward here. Um, particularly if you live in one of the biggest cities, the further more regional you get, maybe not. Um, but I think it's probably got something to do with like the amount of poverty that there is in the UK and how difficult it is to, you know, buy devices and things for your kids so that they can take them to school. You know, how many kids are on free school meals because they're, they're, Household income is, is so low. Lots of schools here, even public schools, you know, they require their kids to have devices that they bring into school. It's kind of on the, you have to have one. So I think that, yeah, it is more technologically forward here because they put more emphasis on that. It's a good thing. Uh, ben, we did the whole thing where my son was four when we moved. He had done seven months of reception in the UK. He started prep here, which is reception as soon as we got there. So he did 16 months of prep. Do you know what will happen, Ben? He, he'll never remember it. <laughs> that won't be something that crosses his mind. Um, but thanks for that. Yeah, it, it does happen sometimes. Tom, greetings, Ross Boss. Ah, oh, thanks, mate. In terms of activities and things to do in Brisbane for a family of four, would we be occupied enough, mate? There's so much to do in Brisbane every freaking week. I reckon I would go as far as to say you could probably plan something new to do every weekend and you'd fill out every week of the year and then you could just redo them all again because they're that good that you don't mind doing it every year. We went out, out on a boat 
last weekend. Um, that video is one that I've got, got to do for, for later in the week. Uh, I'll show you what that's like. You know, the, the place of the never ending summer in Queensland. What's it like to go out on a boat? Mate, there's so much stuff to do. And more importantly, there's so much free stuff to do. So, you know, I know in the UK, if you wanted to go out, particularly as families on the weekend, it kind of felt like every time you'd be bleeding money, I've got to pay for this this weekend. Yes, there are things that cost money in Brisbane. Yeah, otherwise, how would we run an economy? But you could easily do it whereby one weekend we're doing free activities. Next weekend, we're not. We can we can spend some money on doing things. Um, even maybe once a week, you could probably just oh sorry, once a month that week we're going to do the spending activities, and then three free ones. Um, which is the thing that I that kind of blew my mind with how much stuff you can do here that is free, um, and the weather is great for it. And then you even have like your seasonal stuff. So I I, I couldn't work out until I experienced it why a lot of the parks were vacant during the summer and it's because it's so bloody hot you just go to the beach where you go to the the splash parks or things like that it's so much free stuff amps crypto hey mate how's it going uh main man did you consider moving to an eu country uh we did uh sam did ask why don't we just move to spain uh, i guess it's from the perspective of i don't speak spanish so well um and from a perspective of finding a job that was going to pay me so much significantly more. Um, Australia definitely pipped Spain from that perspective. And then just kind of like from a, what kind of lifestyle do I want for me and my kids and them growing up? And that's the main bit that ticked Australia for us. Um, I felt like if I was moving to another EU country, I might be able to get a little bit more better weather but then it was it just seemed like the same kind of uk issues i mean i'm sure there are some nice parks in spain that you can probably go to but like i've not found a bad one in australia yet. actually i did there was one in our local area it was a bit naff i mean it, it was just a bit naff it wasn't bad uh and they they ripped it out <laughs> So it no longer exists. It was literally like a slide and one of those, you know, the rocky things that's like a big spring. And I think it was a koala or something. You know, they sit in the little koala and it springs back with the force. It was a slide, one of them, and a swing. And it's a bit naff. No cover over the top of it. Never saw a kid playing on it. And yeah, council just decided rip it out, put it, put a load of grass on. That's one less thing we can maintain. And then obviously they can spend the money on maintaining other parks. Um, never knew a park in the UK to have a toilet that wasn't trashed they're all free decent here so yeah there's there was kind of felt like there was nothing from a eu perspective that i wanted to raise my family in uh rid out since moving to australia in 2005 as a family living in the gold coast uh we've achieved more than we could ever have in the uk and improved every aspect of life healthcare work life back mate Cheers for, for saying that because, you know, I guess if we were still listening to, to Debbie and how crap Australia is, we'd be worried. But for for every bad experience that someone has moving here, and, and people do have them, um, and, I, and I feel bad for them, um, I think we need to have our minds open to the fact that moving to Australia isn't going to be all sunshine and rainbows. But for every bad experience or challenge that, I find people have are uh, there are five, ten more people that are willing to say no. Well, I've ha I've had a good experience, so I, I I know I need to share more with you of the challenges and the difficulties, and I always try and be factual and impartial on everything that I say. And just th this is my opinion. You know, opinions are like assholes. Everyone's got one, but don't listen to the the downers. And to be honest, if that's something that really does affect you then maybe it isn't for you. Like deep down, maybe it really isn't for you. And that's fine. You know, there's plenty of places in the world. Some people aren't like, they don't like the Australian lifestyle. That isn't the perfect one. But for me, that's how I want to live my life. Uh, Joma, I reckon you get great value for money in your taxes. We're well looked after. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I did a, a reel the other day about um, the fact that some lots of people now you're having to pay for um doctors it's more difficult to find a bulk billing gp you can still find them um 
there's going to be a slight cost in most of them. I think mine now, he was bulk bill. Now he's 20 bucks if I want to go and see him. But I can still see him like the next day sometimes. Like appointment times, there's never an issue. Um, and for 20 bucks, like what's 20 bucks? I go to the bloody pub. It cost me more than 20 bucks for a palmy. Like, whereas if in the, I lived in England and someone said, oh, it's 20 quid, which I know isn't 20 bucks, but... Like it was 20 quid or even a tenner. Like what? It just felt I just felt more tight with money because everything was so much tighter. I didn't have as much disposable income at the end of it. So if if that's what it costs to see my doctor the next day, 20 bucks, and then get exactly the care that I need, and then I don't have to see him again for however many months. I don't think that's a bad deal. Uh biscuit and gardening has work from home taken over Australia like it has here in England. Yeah. I think COVID did that. Um, lot, I know loads of people that work. I, if, if that is the facility that has the work that you do, loads of people do it. And why wouldn't you? The amount of time you spend traveling to, to jobs, for what? Just to travel. If I can do the same job from home, I, I want to do it. One day, I guess teaching will do that as well. Uh, Andy Parker, hobbies, play seven aside, footy in the UK. Great way to meet up. I know soccer. It, mate, soccer. Despite what they all tell you about AFL and NRL, more people play soccer in Australia than any other sports. Fact. So you'll be fine. Um, and I know because I looked into it, uh, they do loads of seven-a-side leagues, particularly like indoor football. And um, yeah, uh, one of my mate Paul, he, he works down. There was a place in Strathpine that was looking at doing it. Um, it's just the timings never kind of worked out for me. But yeah, loads of people do it. Well, weirdly, loads of guys play netball. Not going to poo-poo it. Why not? Especially as I'm getting older, I don't want to get hurt as much. So last thing I want is some bloke trying to prove how hard he is and kicking me up in the air playing football when I could just play netball instead. Still get a good runaround. Uh, Jomo, soccer, amateur football clubs everywhere. Yep, absolutely. Mate, whatever one you want. AFL, NRL, they've even got a few union ones as well. Probably going to be more so down south you will find a sport and you will find sports that you never thought that you could do like as a team sport. And if you want to try it out, go for it. Uh, da, 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 da. You, yeah. From a 42 perspective as well, Andy, you probably qualify for like a specific league, like a veterans league kind of stuff. So yeah, you wouldn't be playing with like some 21 year old. Um, Jomo, look at you answering all the questions by cheers. Thanks. Uh, Andy, not uncommon for people playing f into their fifties in Australia. Can you talk about teaching out there and how your skills transferred? OJ, yes. Uh, teaching out here. Hey, the kids just talk Australian to me, but they're the same kind of kids, the same challenges, uh, the same issues. I'm happier teaching in Australia than I was in the UK. So I'd probably go as far as to say that there are, the same good things and bad things, but just probably more good things than there are bad things. Like there's just fewer quantities of, of that. Um, but yeah, skills transferred easily. The one thing that I would say that's probably the best transferable thing is your ability to build relationships with the kids. Um, particularly in the background of the kids that I work with, that's probably the thing that's the most transferable. Um, and it comes down to anything. People don't buy things from people they don't like. People don't trust people they don't like. And when you're trying to impart knowledge onto people with the best intentions to make their lives better, the thing that you've got to work on first is the relationship that you have with them. So that's probably the thing that I would say that you need to transfer the most. Uh, what are my thoughts on superannuation? It's great. Better than the pension system. Um, I can choose who my superannuation is with. I can choose how that superannuation is invested. Um, the fact that I contribute the least to my superannuation and my employer contributes the most to it. Right? It didn't necessarily feel that way in the UK. Mate, I think it's better than the, the pension system in the UK. Uh, da, 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 da. Tammy, thank you for always sharing advice and being real. We moved to the UK from South Africa and we're now starting uh, to look at our option to move to Australia. Thank you. Thank you. I, I know of loads of people that have made the move directly from South Africa. There's loads of South. Do you know what? My favorite 
um, Biltong shop is in South uh, is in Strathpine. Mate, every time I, I still go back for haircuts there, I'm due one soon, and I was visit and get get me some Biltong. So loads big South African South African community in Australia. You'll be uh, you'll fit in well. Nigel, uh, as retired old fart, I now think we're far better looked after than in the UK. And absolutely, because if you're in the UK, you'd have them cold winters to have to deal with as well. Um, if you live up here, that's the thing. I, I think to myself, when I do get older and I'm looking to retire, I don't need to go anywhere. I can just stay here. Obviously, perhaps downsize, but you know, I've got the warm weather. I'm not going to have to worry about heating. Well, I'm probably, ironically, I'm still going to have to worry about heating my home in the winter, but probably not as much as I would in the UK. And not 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 because I'm going to die, just because I'm a little bit chilly. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. Blue Dog, flexible working arrangements has been offered strongly. Yep. And I would go as far as to say, I think, I think Australian HR and that whole workers' rights is, is stronger in Australia. Um, I'd go, I, I don't know really, because I've never worked in America, but I like America just seems to me like it hates its employees. Like if you don't want to put up with it, we're just going to fire you. Like it, it seems like you have no rights and you rely on tips. But I would, if, if I'm going to say that America is at the worst end of the spectrum, there's probably countries that are far worse. And then Australia is here. Then the UK is somewhere like here. Um, I, I feel like it, it's better. And it's getting more so now that you can even negotiate with certain employers what you want as the terms. If if they if they want you to work for them, you've got to tell them what you you're prepared to do. Um, yeah, absolutely. Volunteering is a great way to to build up a, a social circle as well. Um, the Ollie boy, hey Ross, how's it going? What is the livable income for a family of seven over there a week, roughly? My husband is having to take a pay cut to come over for the first three years uh, on his visa. I'm assuming that's probably some kind of trade related one. I know that for some of the trades, they're not necessarily directly transferable straight away. You have to kind of work your way up a little bit again. Um, that's a tough question because I don't know where you live. Um, I don't know a lot really um, how much. thousand bucks thousand to two thousand dollars depending on how much you want to eat noodles but you'll have to give me a few more uh a few more details uh mrs kp two of my children are autistic both in mainstream i've heard getting through the medicals when trying to get visas can be tricky which is frustrating as they are great kids very clever and would contribute as adults in australia brilliantly yeah uh i i taught a lad um last year he moved over from the uk with his family. I'm not sure what visas and stuff they were. Um, he'd been here since he was about 10. When I first started teaching, he was 16, taught him all the way through to 18. He got an apprenticeship as a, as a sparky. He was autistic. I mean, yeah, you could tell he was different to the other kids, but I, mean, I thought he was great. Um, and oh, that's the tricky, the tricky part is that I'm not a doctor. I can't make the judgments on medicals and what they're going to view and what they're going to say. And obviously I don't know where on the spectrum your kids are. Um, the only thing I can say, Mrs. KP is, is I wish you all the best. Um, and I know your kids will, will make a great contribution in life. Um, and just, I hope that you, you get what you need from, from the medicals, but I can't, I can't make that decision. Um, and this is, yeah, I'm not a doctor. They're, they're the ones that make the call, unfortunately. And it's heartbreaking for lots of people when that can be the end of their dream. And that's probably another reason why you need to speak to a, a visa agent. Even if you're just going to go for the, for the free assessment, like true blue migration can offer you because whilst they, again, you know, they're not the medical experts, but they will probably be able to give you a little bit more free advice about what what could happen particularly if you're in the early stages of what do we need to do to move to australia uh amps crypto how do you feel about holidays breaks and time off for teachers are you public or private so i'm i work in a private school um technically but we follow the same holidays as as the public sector so i get 
the standard two weeks off um, and then five weeks uh, over the summer. It basically, and then with the, the public holidays and stuff that we have, it seems like we get more public holidays in term time than we get time off for. We basically work out at, yeah, the, the same as if I worked in a, in a public school in the UK. So I, I don't, I don't find it an issue. Uh, I know my mate works in another private school. He gets three weeks off for his winter break. He's off a little bit earlier than me um, for the summer as well. So yeah, if you work in a private school over here, definitely, and you've come from the public sector in the UK, it will definitely seem like there's a lot more holidays. Uh, Colette, how's the winter weather? We're moving to the Gold Coast in August. Oh, it's going to be cold. Uh, and we've heard it's blue skies, not too rainy in mid-20s. Um, do you prefer... Sam prefers the the spring and autumn, definitely. Um, I, I don't care. I just love it as hot as possible. Um, if it gets too hot, I just go in the pool or turn the air con on. Um, it's going to be chilly. Bring some jumpers. Bring some trousers. Uh, don't just pack T-shirts and shorts uh, or you'll have to go to Kmart and buy them because it gets cold as soon as that sun goes down. We've packed everything up yeah. for holidays. Do you want to say hello to everyone? I'm talking to people. I'm answering their questions. What's that? That's a camera. So it's that camera there. Yeah. Yeah. Can I finish answering the questions? And then we're going to have dinner. <laughs> you want to come and sit up? Okay. Uh, Ant Crypto, what's the typical start and end time for secondary teachers in public school? Uh, I start at about half seven. I finish at half three. Pretty standard. Uh, probably the same in the public schools as well. <laughs> do you find you miss family holidays to other countries or city breaks to Europe being so far away? Well, yeah, we're not going to, we're not going to have city breaks to Europe anymore, but um, we just kind of do city breaks to um, different towns and cities in, okay. in Australia. I'm okay. <laughs> like, like I said, <laughs> like I said, we're moving to, to Harvey. We're not moving. We're going to Harvey Bay for a couple of days. Um, that's you. that's our city break. You. That's what we would have done on the holidays Mommy anyway. Um, so no, we, th this is this is our family now. Uh, and if you're looking to move to Australia, this is the family that you need to to take into consideration the most. Um, so it's not to say disregard the other elements of the family, but you got to do what's best for these. So. No, we don't miss family holidays because this is the family that we do. And actually, one of the things that we're looking at doing um, with Sam's parents is the whole idea of maybe we'll meet them halfway uh, and we'll find somewhere so that you can go see Gangan. Gan. And, um, and, and we can both have a holiday that way. Uh, yeah, Jomo, you're right. If you do want a bit of a, a damp winter or cold winter, go to Melbourne. Um Luke, I'm currently working as a police officer in the Met and seeing the crime rate and the type of crime that occurs is horrific. In your opinion, would you say the crime rate? Yeah, I think it is lower. It's definitely lower. And it's weird because you do get instances of really, really bad crime. Yes. Were well, you going to go downstairs and have some food? Then? You do get experiences of really bad crime. I'll come soon. I'll come soon. I'm being told uh, you do get instances of like quite bad crime. I mean, what's the worst one that I heard in the last weeks? I think uh, on the Gold Coast, there was a, a gang shooting. Yeah, people get shot in Australia. Um, they murdered him in a car park. So it does happen. But the fact that those types of crime make the the news, I think, proves that it happens more rarely than it does in the UK. You know, gang members getting stabbed, shot. It happens in the UK a lot, particularly if you, you live in London and you work in the Met. Um, but it never makes the news. So it's because of the frequency that it happens. They, why, would, why would you report on something that's happening all the time? Whereas they report on it here because it doesn't happen as often. Um Paulius, good day, mate. I'm from a country where we don't have working holiday visas. Would you recommend going to Australia through a study route? Uh, I would go to a trade school. Uh, yeah, uh, I would recommend whatever route you can follow to to get here. Um, if you're willing to to go through that, absolutely. Um, particularly as it's an experience. Um, Brick Lane course plumbing. Any other skills in the pond? Only 23. Don't have any skills yet. 
to, to be honest, there's plenty of young people in Australia that probably don't want to go through those kind of um, trades. They're in demand. Uh, if that's your way to to find a route to live here permanently, uh, I wish you all the best, bud. Um, Big P, nice to see you, bud. Uh, Lindsay, Miss KP, difficult speaking to a specialist agent, spoke to George Lombard. Absolutely, I'd agree with Lindsay as well. If your kids are already in mainstream school, I'd definitely make that clear to the doctors or the, whoever's doing the medical. Yeah, I can't imagine it would be. See, from the kids that I've worked with in the UK that are on the spectrum and going to mainstream schools, I don't see that that, that should be a reason why they can't go and do everything that they need to do to, to move to Australia. Blue Dog, uh, he's replying to Luke. May May replying to Paulius. Uh, right, KJ loves coffee. Question about the teaching profession. Is there any chance for a retired teacher, uh, full-time substitute teacher? Absolutely, from a um, sub-perspective or even full-time. Um, definitely from a primary school perspective. I know primary schools primary schooling isn't normally on the list for moving over here so if the question is can you get a job as a retired teacher and go back into teaching he yes would you want to jump through all of the hoops to get registered as a teacher because i know that i that's something that i had to do um you know it's basically like being an nqt again i don't know if you'd want to do that um because that's what you have to do in order to get your teaching registration to become fully registered um could you, if you're retired, move over here? Probably not, because I don't know what visa options would be open to you, whether that's something you want to do if you were slightly older in years. But yeah, you could find a job if you're retired. Um, Luke, thanks for letting me know. Okay, Tammy Lee. Oh my gosh, you're always so cute. She's a carbon copy. Yeah, uh, I've got one that looks like Aurora. Well, Aurora looks like Sam and the other one, bless her, looks like me. Um, I'm going to go, therefore, are oh, you thinking about your mum? Well, oh, yeah. Again, I don't know what visa she'd get, but the, the thing that comes to my mind that would be the biggest challenge for her would be, would she want to jump through the hoops to get registered? Because you can't teach if you're not registered. Um, right. If there's no more questions on the chat, uh, I'll go through here. So uh, do you still use the pool at this time of year? No, it's bloody freezing. I don't know how some people do the um, ice baths. Mate, I jumped in my pool the other month uh, and it, just to see how long I'd last. I think I lasted about three minutes. It was freezing. And I've just added a load of winterizer to it, which is supposed to help keep it clean because I know that when I did it last year, I essentially just chucked the pool cover over it. And when I opened it up, it looked nuclear how green it was. So this year, still keeping everything running, still adding a few chemicals. You don't need half as much as you needed um, because it's so cold and there's no algae and stuff growing within it. The filter's still going, but that just runs through the day anyway because I've got solar. Um, but no, don't use it. Would I and am I going to be looking into uh, some kind of solar heating for extending the swimming time so that we can swim a little bit more into the um, autumn and start a little bit sooner in the spring? Definitely. Uh, and once both kids are swimmable, that's if I haven't got it done by then, I think I'll be losing out on valuable swimming time. Um, what did you do to make friends more easily when you move? That's another question from Darren. Um, mainly for us, it was through the kids. Um, we found, we found friends through, through the kids. We found friends through work. We found friends through YouTube and other kind of social media things, Facebook groups, things like that. Uh, I, we found friends, Sam joined like a, a few mums groups, um, with Aurora. So we've also met some people through there. Um, you never know where you're going to meet mates. Um, the thing is with neighbors, friends that are neighbors, um, you just got to be open. You just got to be willing to make mates. You got to realize that it is really, really difficult to make friends as an adult. But as long as you are trying to do it, you're not going to make friends with everyone. You're not going to spend all the time speaking to everyone. But sometimes you make better mates than you did when you were at school. Not that I don't miss my schoolmates as well. Um, 
Is the weather still nice in winter? I'll answer that one. Da, 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 da. Where are we up to? Uh, how much money? This is from LJB off Instagram. How much money should you take over to get set up? As much as you can afford. When we came over, we'd sold the house so that we could dip into whatever deposit money we had left over. We didn't actually need to dip into it too much. Most of it still went back into the house. Um, we brought over 10 grand cash. That's the most amount of money that you can bring in without having to declare it in Australia. And that helped to start and set us up with rentals and everything. The fortunate thing was we, um, yeah, we had two weeks in quarantine. Yeah, we had to pay a few grand for that. Thanks, Australian government. Um, but we got straight into an Airbnb. We were in there for about a week. And then we found a rental that we got straight into. Like for us, everything kind of seemed to to fall into place. So for us, that meant that the 10,000, oh, then I started work like a week after I'd got let out of quarantine. So because everything kind of fell into place, we didn't really eat too much into the, the $10,000. It was, it was more than enough. Even managed to buy some furniture when we went, moved into the rental. I would be concerned if I was taking less than that, not that it wouldn't work, but you just have less of a buffer. So if stuff started to, to take longer or there was issues and it didn't go right, but by that, that same token, I'm pretty confident that I would have found a job to go into, like just do something just to earn money, even if it wasn't necessarily teaching. Um, but that's how much money we took. Uh, Anna Jane Hughes from Instagram. How long did it take you to really feel like home? Um, I, I guess I was pretty quick. As soon as we moved into this place, I, I kind of felt like we're starting to put down roots and it started to feel like home for me. I don't really call the UK home anymore. It's just a place that I lived and where a lot of my friends and family live. Sam still calls it home sometimes, but I'd like to think, and we've talked about it, like I think she does see this place as home. But also from the perspective, I don't think it's a bad thing to think of yourself as having multiple homes. If that's if that's how you think and that's what you want to think of it like, like the UK is is a type of home, this is now home for us. You also need to think about it from the perspective of, well, for me, I don't really want to move back to the UK. I don't, I don't, right now, there's nowhere else in the world that I'd rather live. But it doesn't mean that I wouldn't change my mind. Sam is probably more open to the idea of, I don't, she wouldn't mind moving back to the UK at some point when she's older. Um, I don't think you have to have so, so much of a fixed mindset. And I think it's probably quite dangerous to have a fixed mindset of I'm definitely, I've definitely got to be one place or the other because it it's not as black and white as that. And that's when you start to, to be able to disappoint people, disappoint yourself. If you start to be too fixed with that mindset right now, this is our home. Um, and no, it doesn't, it doesn't take too long, but don't be concerned if it does like just, just let it, let it do what it does. But, but don't do things that are going to be counterproductive and to de like like you're trying to self sabotage yourself. Just let let the course be its course. And if it doesn't work out for you, for some people this this isn't what they want. It isn't what it they thought it was going to be. Let that happen as well if that's you. Because otherwise you, you you're doing damage to yourself. Um, Bryony Newman, how does the dentist work over there? Uh, looked into it and not sure how they're covered. Um, Lots of people have extra health insurance in Australia. And if that's something that you want to do, you can do so. We we personally don't. Um, with a lot of the health insurance, there is an allocation towards dental treatment. Um, we don't have that. So we we just pay. Um, so our checkups are a couple of hundred bucks each, um, which can kind of seem quite steep for from a dental perspective, having a checkup, having a good clean and all that kind of stuff. I know that if you wanted to have private dental in the UK, it probably wouldn't be as much, but then you also have to factor in that, well, things are just a bit more expensive in Australia. Um, you can get free dental in the UK, but I used to do that and it was, it was shit. So like, they just go, ah, and you're looking, you gob and that was it. I've had uh, a filling done here um, that I, I, I chipped my tooth in the UK. I had it filled in the UK um, and then it, it popped out. 
and it probably lasted less time in the UK than it has after having it done in Australia. And I, I think it looks better. I can't even know. I don't even notice it. It's actually in the front of my teeth. Um, so I don't know if something costs more, but it's better quality. Is that a problem? It's just how much it costs. Right? Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, do you recommend true blue migration? I'm nearly ready to sign. This is Lind Jaya. Absolutely. Um, I would always recommend using uh, a migration agent. I have never spoken to anyone who has used a migration agent and thought that nah, it wasn't worth it. Um, True Blue Migration is is our choice. That's who we would recommend. There are also plenty of other good ones out there. The only thing I would say is that if you are thinking about using a migration agent, make sure they are registered. If they are registered, they'll have a number on their website that is their registration number. That's the one that you can check on the Australian immigration websites and just check that they're legit because I have heard of so many people that have used dodgy Mara and dodgy Mara dodgy migration agents that when you look into it, they're not Mara registered agents and they've just been scanned. So if you want to know that you're not going to get scanned and the other thing as well to think about is that um, if they are Mara registered, there is a cap on how much they can charge as agents and fees. And <laughs> here's the thing. If there's a cap, all of the Mara registered agents will all charge the same amount. So it's just, if you want to use an agent, the cost is just the cost. We've been able to help tens. I, I don't even know if we, we're near the hundreds yet. Um, I can check that out. But we, we've helped so many people through this channel by recommending True Blue Migration Services. I've not heard one yet that has gone through the process and said no. And if you look on Google, you look at their reviews, it's like four point seven or eight nine it's like stupidly high it's pretty much five you're always going to get people like debbie they're just going to whinge that's probably the people that brought it down it's not a five definitely recommend them speak to them free visa assessment they'll tell you exactly what you need to do to move to this country no obligation if you want to stay with them you can if you just want to take that information and do with it what you want you can do that too um Lindsay Bell, what is Sam's opinion on the SEN education that is available in Brisbane? She doesn't really have one. Uh, she used to work in special schools in the UK. She found it more difficult to cross over to do so in Australia She because she was essentially a teacher's assistant. Um, the level of qualifications she required to work in that sector in the UK were lower. Even if you want to work as a teacher's assistant here, you pretty much need still need to be a fully qualified teacher. So she doesn't have an opinion because she couldn't directly transfer it over, but her qualifications, another part of work that she did do was disability support. So that's, that is more directly transferable. So that's what she's gone into. Um, Mrs. Uh, R. Akram, what is the best uh, option to take your car or to sell it in the UK? Mine is worth $35,000. Do you know what? Originally my opinion was sell it and just buy something equivalent here too much of a pain in the ass but one of the things i've changed my opinion on that and i was speaking to a guy the other day and apparently he looked up his car his new new car that he bought and he said that the equivalent is a or to, to have the same thing is one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars. now originally when he asked me should i bring it over i was like nah mate just sell it and get an equivalent but when he told me it was $135,000 and obviously he didn't pay $135,000 I would go okay so well, what did you pay for it dollar equivalent if it's worth $135,000 here and the cost to ship it over is less than that do it absolutely do it but as a genuine I, I, what did I have I had a 10 year old Ford Focus sold it mate bought, bought something new here <laughs> That's my answer for that. Uh, what is the best option to ship things or buy from scratch? Um, we use the Move Cube. They do different levels, small, medium, or large. We did a small Move Cube. We shipped over some of our more valuable stuff and our kind of memories things. Um, I definitely recommend the service. Definitely good. Um, however, I would just think within yourself, how much do you really need to move? Functional stuff probably don't need it because you can just as easily buy a new one here what don't think of it just as a cost saving but how long did we spend having to pack itemize 
you know, waiting for stuff, like the time, the time factor of not being able to just go, I don't have one of these anymore because I sold it and I'm just going to go and buy a new one here. That, that is something that you need to take into consideration. Is that worth it? Or do you have $135,000 worth of car? It, it, it can be easier just to sell it, buy a new one, buy an equivalent one. But if, if you if you don't want to do that or what you have is too sentimental, we use the Move Cube. We definitely recommend them. Um, 7Cs Move Cube. Um, also, we sent a Send My Bag. So Send My Bag is like a rapid way. Move Cubes take months. Send My Bag, you literally pack the bag, um, strap it all up, lock it, um, put the the labels and stuff that they set print for you. Someone comes and collects it from your door in the UK and then it's delivered to your door in Australia. We actually did it. We set it all up first. And then we, when once we'd gone and we had somewhere to deliver it to, then we just arranged for Sam's dad to give it to the delivery guy. And that's, that is a service that again, I would recommend. And if you go onto our Instagram, we actually have a, a 5% discount for that. Um, so if you use send my bag, or you're thinking about doing, you, you've got literally just a suitcase worth of send it and you don't want to have to pay excess baggage because um, it's a lot cheaper. Definitely do send my bag. You can say 5%, check out on our Instagram um, or on our website, there should be a, a 5% link or just message me and I'll let you know what it is. Save yourself some money. AFL or NRL hours in places, NRL for me. Not to say that I don't like AFL and I'd like to go to a, to a game to watch it more, but I, yeah, I'm just more into NRL. Um, JT Walker is using air conditioner in Oz and summer cheaper than heating in winter. Yes, but the only reason I say that is because um, we have solar panels. So that offsets our total energy bill so much anyway. Um, we... Oh, I'd go as far as to say we pay about just over a hundred bucks a month for our energy. So yeah, 60 quid a month. No one's paying that in the UK for their energy at the moment. Could we be a bit more liberal with the heating and air con? If you are Sam, probably yes. <laughs> um, Holly Halley, what age would you say is too late to move with children? Never. It's never too late. If this is what you want, do it. Uh, you can be like our mate who's moving at 42, like just do it. They'll, they'll adapt. They'll, they'll whinge. The older they get, the more they'll whinge. But again, moving to Australia isn't for everyone. And I'd like to think that Australia has more to offer for kids than in the UK. This is the the main reason why I moved here is for, for my kids. Um, but it's never too late to move. Do you wish you moved to Australia early in your life, Rob Mack? Oh, I wish I'd done a working holiday visa. And I remember when I was in my early 20s, it's probably when I first met Sam, I, th I wish I had been bolder and had more courage to say to her, hey, should we just go and live in Australia for a year and see, see what happens? Do you know what the worst thing that I probably did that impacted on that was I bought a house. What should I have done? I should have just rented it. That's what I should have done when I was younger. And the good thing is that now, uh, up to 35, you can now come over to Australia um, up to the age of 35. You can do three years. You don't have to do the f 88 days of farming now to extend your stay. You can just literally come for as long as you want. If you're thinking about it and you're not sure and you're under 35 and you're living in the UK, do it. What's the worst that's going to happen? You spend some money, make some memories, and you go back. Um, Louise Forster, what time does the sun set over there? Uh, at the moment in winter, it's probably setting about five o'clock. That's probably the earliest. Um, when did it used to set in the UK in the middle of winter? It's like four. I used to drive home and it would be dark. Um, do I miss UK summer evenings? No, because... I imagine it would be a pain in the ass to get my kids to sleep because literally as soon as it goes dark now, they know they've got to go to bed and that's like anywhere between five and seven o'clock. So I was having to do that up until like nine, 10 o'clock at night. I think that would be a pain. If you like the more prolonged summer evening thing, go further south. 
you, you, it's just because we're subtropical here in Brisbane that we don't really get that. Um, but that's what I prefer. And the the colours of the sunsets that we get here are far superior to what you get in the UK. And because it, it happens so quickly, it's like watching TV. It's probably better than watching Australian TV. Um, how hard is it to rent in Queensland? Uh, I am Gia. Oh, we've already answered that. If you want to know the easy answer, uh, check out some of the podcasts. Um, the one that we've done recently, the one that's going to be coming out next month. Um, they also have found it easy. And there's some tips in there about how you can also find a rental easier. Don't listen to Debbie and think that there's no rentals in, in Australia. Right. I've got a few more in here. Da, 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 da. Right. Where did we get up to? Uh, so I'm going to answer these and then we'll probably end it there. It's been an hour 44. Uh, Pete Francis, when you moved out there, what did you do about your pension from the UK? Are you able to cash them out or do you still get them paid out? So uh, they're left. Um, I'm not actually sure whether I even qualify for the state pension. I think I'm around about the 10 years. So I'd qualify for like a mini pension. My teacher's pension still got the login details and that will cash out for however much it is when I hit pensionable age. I'm kind of looking at it from the perspective of that's not what I'm going to be relying on when I become older. Um, that's why I pay, do extra contributions into my superannuation now. Fortunately, I work for an employer that they will also even match my additional contribution, so I'll get even more. Uh, I think I'm currently on about 16% of my wage is currently going into my superannuation. And then whatever I get as an addition from um, the UK is just going to be a bonus. Um, like I said before, I think the superannuation system in Australia is far superior to the, the pension system in the UK. And yeah, I'm just viewing it as because it's just there and I can't do it. There's a guy, he's called John Hovarth. He's on one of the um, uh, Brits in Australia Facebook groups. He is someone who I will definitely speak to when I get a bit older about how to do it. But at the moment, the short answer I got kind of got from him is now nah, there's not a lot you can do about it, but there are things you can do when you kind of, it becomes that time. Um, God, I mean, blue dog youth crime rate in Queensland is lowest. It's been in 10 years. Don't believe the hype. Do you know what? You wouldn't believe that from the amount that the the news tells you. And that's the thing in Australia. They, they're too focused on what the news is telling them and they don't listen to facts. I think that's something that coming from the UK, I think the BBC was because it's so impartial, like it has to be when you come here and you see the news outlets and we all know about like, you know, Murdoch and his, his news outlets. He's Australian, isn't he? They, they oh, overhype, they sensationalize things. I know that if I went onto the statistics and I looked at youth crime statistics 10 years ago to now, I wouldn't be surprised if you were right. It, it's just literally news outlets have got nothing else to talk about that, oh, some, some youths stole a car and wrapped it around a tree. God forbid they, they hurt someone else. Like it happens. It happens everywhere kids commit crime that's stupid but you got to look at the greatest statistics so i wouldn't be surprised if you're right and the weirdo in me will look at be on my phone when i'm watching crap australian tv later trying to find out where that statistic is true paul enjoy a few days away and have fun with the kids cheers paul thank you very much i hope we will but apparently it's going to rain uh i'm gonna jump in tracky dax and i have my heater on i live in cannon hill just south of brisbane cbd it's bloody cold for us queenslanders and tell us if we're wrong blue dog i've heard that cannon hill is a nice area to live in so if you're thinking about south side hopefully that might be all right um ross you just love the fact that you did your job interview on the toilet yeah i did mate i've got 100 percent success rate for job interviews on the toilet and that's probably what the reason why I'm never going to leave my place, because unless it's going to be on the toilet, I, I might not be so successful. Um, Jay Givax, how quickly or slowly do they approve teaching registration for UK citizens that have secured a visa? Um, so I, I think I started the application in the December. Once my visa had been approved, I had to, yeah, some hoops you have to jump through to get things signed off and stuff. So I then used my. Um, principal my head teacher to sign those off for the copies and that was done by about the february half term and then by the uh, april the easter when i'd finished i'd got my teaching number and i was starting to apply for jobs with my teaching number and that's the best thing that you can do because then they know that at least you you 
can teach in the state that you're looking for, but um, it can go quicker. I've heard if you already have an employer, like let's say you were here and you hadn't had that bit sorted out yet. Um, I know that if there's an employer that's like, we need this person to start at whatever date, um, they'll, they'll literally contact Queensland teachers, um, QCT, Queensland College of Teachers, and they will expedite your application as long as you've got everything obviously signed off. Um, question, do you have any agreement like we'll look at ours for one or two years and then assess if we like it, want to stay? Yeah. Um, the thing is, though, for us, me and Sam, she had always known that wanting to move to and live in Australia permanently was um, something that I wanted to do. This, this is my dream. And I, I guess, fortunately, I, I have a, a wife, a partner who is really, really supportive of me. Like, I, I just... I love just, I have crazy ideas of stuff that I want to do and I just, I just want to go and do it. That, that's who I am. And I guess that's the bit that I love the most about my wife is the fact that she is willing to support me in doing so because she knows as well that the decisions that I'm making, they're not, they're not selfish decisions for me. I wanted to move here because I genuinely believe that this is the best place for us as a family and to raise our kids. And she, she can see that. Um, so I guess you, you have to have that conversation. You have to be as, as frank with, with your partner. Like why, why is it going to be one or two years? What, what is it that you're looking for? What is it that you want so that you, you both can see that that is happening or not? I hope it does happen for you, but unless you can specifically quantify what it is, that's going to be better. That's when resentment from other sides can start to come in because they can't see it as clearly as perhaps you can. Jules, good day from WA. Nice to see you, Jules. Uh, Mrs. KP, thank you. Thanks, Ross. Fingers crossed we can make it out there. Fingers crossed for you too, Mrs. KP. Migration made easy. So true about Australian news outlets. <laughs> yep. Um, Jomo, match the employer's minimum super. Best system. Yep. Uh, I pay in 3%. They ain't paying 3%. I'm getting 3% extra on top of all my wages for free. Um and I'm going to get it all at the end. It's essentially free money. I, I give in my money. It gets invested. They give in their money. I'm getting their money for free. Uh, industry super funds are really well managed on economically really powerful institutions. Yep. Uh, I'm with Oz Super. I know loads of mates that are with Q Super because that's just you know, the, the economically, the, the industry super fund that they're with. You can't, you can't really go wrong. Uh, Cannonil is a nice area so far. Hope it continues to be so. Uh, and then Blue Dog, Jomo, I'm in a t-shirt in Melbs. We are made of tougher stuff. Absolutely. You have to be to deal with four seasons in a day. <laughs> right. That is all of the questions. Thank you very much to everyone who is, oh, Michelle, there you go. How long did it take to settle in and how easy for was it for your daughter? My kids are four and one. My daughter doesn't know any different. Both of them don't know any different. Aurora doesn't know any different. This is home for her. She sounds Australian. She doesn't have an Aussie passport yet, um, but she doesn't know any different. So that will be what it's like for your one-year-old. Your four-year-old could be more tricky. And that's why I'd recommend, actually, um, I know that our last podcast that we did, uh, the last video that we put out, they moved and their kid was five. And they've got some tips in there where they shared about how they made the transition a lot easier for them uh, and for their son. So, hey, the previous answer to someone about what, how old is two too old for your kids i wouldn't think that that is too old at all um the, the tougher conversation you're going to have is with grandparents about what, what's it going to be like because you're taking their four and one year old grandchild away from them. that's another different conversation as it is um cheers blue dog yeah open plan living that's another reason probably not the highest reason but yeah that's another reason so uh, thank you very much to everyone for all of your questions. I hope that we've been able to help you out. A um, couple of takeaways. If you want to um, 
see if you can move to Australia, if you want to know what your best options are, speak to True Blue Migration Services. They're on our website. They're on YouTube. Um, all the details are there. Mention us. You get a free visa assessment, no obligation. They'll tell you everything that you need to do to move to Australia, what you can do to realize your dreams. Um, if you want to send a bag over, if you go onto our website, uh, we have it all on our Instagram. There's a link that you can click on. You'll say 5% off your next send my bag. If you want to look into send some money over, that's one thing I didn't mention as well. We also have a link um, for our whys. It's in our stories. Your first uh, transaction is um, for a thousand bucks is absolutely free. Um, we use them all the time to send money backwards and forwards. Um, so hopefully we'll bring in more and more discounts for you, more and more ways to make it even easier. That's That's what we want. We want to bring you value. That's why we do these things. If you have a question, let us know. I'll always answer it as honestly and truthfully as best as I can. Um, SJ Price, last one. Should you, mate? No. I, do you know what? No, I don't think you should commit to anything. You should you should commit to what it is that you're prepared to. Would, would I look down on someone that wanted to move home after two months? No. If that's what they want to do, that's what they want to do. Like they, I, I would actually say fair play to them for trying. I would, I would probably look down more about someone who's giving other people comments about what they should be doing with their life if they have never experienced it themselves. And even to that perspective, like, who am I to to tell you no, you shouldn't do things? I'll tell you what it, my experience was like, and if that's what you want to do, all the best to you. I, I I hope SJ that they found whatever it is that they were looking for after they've moved. I also know some people that have, have done that quick ping pong bit as well. There's loads of ping pong poms that they've done that ping pong bit and they've moved back and then they realized, and that's what they needed to do to realize that, oh, maybe we we made a mistake moving back to the UK or whatever it is that they're from. If that's if that's part of their journey, that's what they got to do to realize whatever it is that they've got to realize so that they can live a happy life. Then, yeah. So, no. Commit as long as you want. Thanks, guys. Thanks for everything. And uh, see you next month.